Hello, my name is Charles Goodman, and this is a video paper review I made for my Intro to Neuroscience class. I am currently studying aprosodia, and the paper I chose to review is Effects of Two Treatments for Aprosodia Secondary to Acquired Brain Injury. This paper was published in the Journal of Rehabilitation Research and Development in 2006, and it was written by John C. Rosenbeck and others. First, some background on aprosodia. Aprosodia is a neurological disorder resulting in the inability of a patient to understand or deliver the proper emotions. While they can still feel the emotions, they are no longer able to produce them with proper affect. Occurring in the right hemisphere, aprosodia is of the same vein as left hemisphere aphasias which result in language-based impairment. The areas most often associated with aprosodia are roughly in the right hemisphere equivalent of Broca's and Wernicke's areas. In order to properly diagnose aprosodia, a trained ear is required. These diagnoses often require subsequent verification by other experts in order to fully confirm the presence of aprosodia. The test performed is the aprosodia battery, which consists of requiring patients to convey specific emotions while saying neutral sentences. Using the example sentence to convey sadness, the clouds in the sky are white. Two treatments for aprosodia were derived from previous publications. These were executed in an AVAC manner over a three month period with a month break in the middle. Not all of the tested emotions were treated. Treatment of fear was withheld from all patients to see if the treatments were able to be generalized to other emotions. The cognitive linguistic therapy was taught using cues rooted in explicit memory. The patient was told and forced to remember intonations and facial expressions associated with a particular emotion in order to properly convey the intended emotion. The treatment started with the patient having access to all of the materials and progressed to forcing the patient to convey the emotion with no help. The hypothesis for this treatment came from the belief that the brain's emotional dictionary was wiped clean and needed to be restored. The imitative therapy was taught using cues rooted in implicit memory. The patient was initially instructed to copy the therapist and then say it with him. This was followed by repetition and copying the therapist with removal of some cues until the patient could act alone. For this treatment comes from the belief that the brain's motor planning and execution centers pertaining to prosody were damaged and required a kickstart through imitation. These results show significant progress due to treatment when compared with the untreated emotion fear. For the full sample size, significant differences were not seen between the scores of the patient at the end of the first treatment and at the end of the second treatment. This table also confirms the efficacy of the treatments. Visual analysis was performed by three different judges and they used plus and minuses as a rating system. The larger effect sizes, calculated by comparing the initial and final scores for each treatment, were mainly seen when a treatment was delivered first. Because of the subjective nature of the information, the data was also analyzed subjectively in conjunction with a statistical analysis. It was found that the largest impact on progress was whether or not the treatment came first, and it didn't really matter which one came first. Overall, the results were hopeful in that 12 of the 14 participants showed progress from both treatments. Contrary to a trend often reported, there was no obvious correlation between the progress of the patient and their being clinically diagnosed with depression. But while a drop was not seen because of depression, the opposite was true in that motivated patients who acknowledged their deficiencies performed better than the others. It was also found that the treatments which helped express happiness, anger, and sadness did not cause the patient to perform any better at conveying fear. The major strengths of this article were in the meticulousness of the analyses made by the researchers. They were quick to address shortcomings in their approach, but they also responded with well-thought explanations or suggestions. The paper had few weaknesses. The appendices describing techniques were only available online, and they didn't even address all techniques mentioned. Additionally, some of the graphs and tables were not clear enough to be taken out of context of the section to which it pertained. Several changes to the experimental protocol were suggested throughout the paper as a means to shore up deficiencies in the study. It was suggested that treatment be performed at a higher intensity to boost motivation and perform with a larger sample size to be able to more fully understand trends. A higher level of randomization in most aspects of the treatment was also suggested for the study in hopes of determining the best course of treatment. Ultimately, it is hoped that a treatment will be created which does not need to appeal to single emotions at a time, but will have a general impact on effective prosody. In reading this paper, there seemed to be several recurring themes. The first was how plastic the brain is, with the ability of patients to show significant recovery in a matter of mere weeks. Secondly, the researchers often commented on some of the challenges in the range with which a single emotion can be conveyed. Fear can be a loud yelp of surprise, or it can be a hushed whisper of cautiousness. Finally, this paper helped me to realize the difficulty in making progress when working with a condition that does not affect a large population.